this video will discuss how to solve systems of equations with matrices. So when we talk about systems, we have to first recognize that we have three different options for solutions. We could say that the system is consistent, where it has at least one solution, but there could be infinite solutions. It's inconsistent, where it has no solution, or it is unique, where it has exactly one solution. Now, the way that we're going to look at this within uh, linear algebra and setting up matrices is we have to recognize that we have uh, the equation AX equals B. So what does that mean? Well, A is going to be our matrix formed by the coefficients of the system on our variables. And then B will represent the constants within the, each equation. And when we set this up, it'll be an M by N matrix for A, where M is going to be the number of equations in the system, that's our rows, and N is the number of variables in the system, that's our columns. Uh, the X will be the same size, M by 1, because each of those values is representing one of the variables. And then the B is going to be M by 1, because that's the solution to each of those equations. So there are multiple ways we can solve a system using matrices. One of those methods is Kramer's rule. Now it's very specific as to when you can use Kramer's rule. Uh, first, it has to be a square matrix, and you have to be able to find the determinant of it so that it is not zero. If that is the case, what we would first do is construct our matrices A and B. Then what we're going to do is we're going to construct uh, multiple matrices replacing a column each time with B until we have all the different variations of matrices uh, with B in each of the different columns. We can then find each value of X by taking the determinant of that created column or that created matrix by the determinant of the original matrix and we can do that for every single one of our X's. So say I have this uh, system. First thing I'd want to do is create the A and the B matrices. So my A matrix, if I look, I've got two, negative two, and I don't have an X3, so that I put in zero. And then one, six, one, and then negative one, negative four, eight. There is my A matrix. And then my constants are on the right-hand side, negative 2, 28, and negative 11. So if I want to create A sub 1 matrix, I'm going to take my B value, my B matrix, and replace it in my first column here. To create A sub 2, I would take my B matrix and replace it in my second column. And everything else stays the same. And then I've got that third column, so I need an A sub 3 that I'm going to replace. And you can see, again, the first two columns are the same, the third column is what changes. So now I find the determinant to find each of these uh, to help me find it. So the determinant of the original matrix is 122. If I find the determinant of A1, I end up with 366. The determinant of A sub 2 would be 488. And the determinant of A sub 3 is 122. So now all I have to do is take to find my first x1, I take my determinant of my first a sub 1 over the determinant of a, and I find that that means that my x1 value was 3. Do the same thing for x2, and I find that its value is 4. And then for x3, I find that its value is 1. So that means that in, to solve this system, I would use x1 is 3, x2 is 4, and x3 is 1. And I can plug those values into each of these equations and see that they are accurate. Now a second, system, uh, second method for solving a system would be to actually use the inverse matrix. If you think about how do we solve an equation like to get x by itself, we would multiply by the inverse. So we would take and multiply b by the inverse of a. And we actually do write it in this direction. It's the inverse of the A matrix times the B matrix. So the first thing you'd have to do is first write your A matrix and your B matrix, as we had before, and we'd need to find the inverse of A. So we can go through and do our row reductions 
so that we can take and take the identity matrix from the right hand side and transform it so the identity matrix shows up on the left hand side and there's previous videos showing how to do that when we follow those methods we'll end up with that the inverse matrix is this 3 by 3 with a lot of fractions but it is the inverse matrix so now I'm going to take my inverse matrix and I'm going to multiply it by my B matrix and if I think about well how do I multiply I'm going to take my row multiply by my column take this row second row multiply by the column take my third row multiply by the column and then simplify each of these rows now I get again these look like fractions but let's see what happens when they simplify and if I simplify it I get 3 4 and 1 which means x1 is 3 x2 is 4 x3 is 1 now those two work when we have square matrices we know that are invertible and their determinants are zero but what if we have other types of systems it's important to recognize that there are there is one method that seems to work in most cases and that would be our gauss jordan elimination so what we would do here is we would set up an augmented matrix where the final column is what we would have considered the the b matrix before we're putting all of it into a single uh, matrix and what we're going to do is we're going to use elementary row operations of replacement interchanging and scaling until we have it in reduced row echelon form so what does reduced row echelon form mean so we have two different forms row echelon and reduced row echelon if we want it in row echelon form we're going to have so that uh, all the rows um, if it, there's a row that has all zeros, it goes to the very bottom of the matrix. We use the interchange. After that, uh, we're looking to see that we start a, that in we start a row with a leading one, and then there may be stuff after it, but the row starts with a one. The row below it should have zeros, and then the to the right should be the the first value should be a one, and again there could be things after, and then so on and so forth so that the diagonals you should see ones uh, and then uh, there's zeros to the left of those ones so we have to have a leading one in each row now if we reduce the row echelon what that means is that a row that has a one every other entry in that column will be zeros so if you look at these two matrices here's row echelon see I've got stuff in the first row um, above in the second column third column whereas in reduced row those are zeros so that's the difference between those two and again that fourth column there that would be like our B matrix so let's go through that example we've been using um, so first we would set up in the augmented matrix so you see here we only use one matrix where that fourth column was our constants and we're going to go through and we're going to change this to reduced row echelon form. So first thing, I want to turn this 1 into a 0 so that I get my leading 1 up here at the top. So to do that, I would say that I'm going to take the second row and subtract half of the first row. Because half of 2 is 1. 1 minus 1 would give me 0. And if I do that, it would simplify to this matrix. Now I want to get rid of this bottom negative 1. Well, how do I do that? I'm going to add a half of that first row because positive 1 plus negative 1 gives me 0. Now, and there's multiple ways you can go. You can go different orders as to how you do it. This is just one of the orders as to how we could do it. Now, I want to get rid of this negative 5 so that there's nothing below the 7. So, I would multiply 7 by 5 7 to give me positive 5. So, I'll multiply that row by 5 7 and now I'm starting to get some fractions but that's okay because look I have 61 7 and 61 7 so if I think about well let's simplify that so I can get rid of the fraction if I multiply that row by just 7 61's that's scaling that changes both of those entries to 1 so now I have 1 and 1 in the bottom I'm getting close now I'm going to start working on trying to uh, turn this to reduced row so I want to remove this one so I'm going to take the second row and subtract the third row. Doing that would give me 
7, 0, and 28 in that row. So now I want to say, well, can I simplify this row? So if I divide this row by 7 or multiply by 1 7th, I could then simplify it so that I have 1, 0, 4. I'm getting really close. Now I need to simplify that top row. So if I multiply, or I take the top row, say I'm going to scale it to 1 half, and add the second row so that this becomes 0, and I can do two steps at once if I want, or you could do it a single step if you like. It'll come out the same, but I decided to do two here. I simplify that. I'm going to end up with 1, 0, 0, 3, 0, 1, 0, 4, and 0, 0, 1, 1. So I have my row reduced echelon form with my final column showing me each of my x values. So the way I could write this is that x equals 3, 4, 1. Now, not every system will be unique. Uh, we saw here that that was a unique system. It had one set of values. Uh, what happens here sometimes when we change it to row echelon form before we start reducing everything, we may see that some columns uh, do not have a pivot column. There may be more variables than there are rows so that we have columns that are free. So a pivot column is a column that has a leading one or could be simplified to have a leading one. These are considered our basic variables. So if it's a column that has a leading one, that is a basic variable. It's going to have a value uh, that's going to be fixed. Whereas our free variable is going to be one that is not in a leading one. It's that free variable, and it's how we are going to construct all of our infinite solutions. So the basic variables are going to be dependent upon these free variables. So when this happens, we're going to rewrite our basic variables to correspond. Often this is done in what we call a parametric vector form. So say that we've simplified a system using our matrices, and the first thing we get to is that we've reduced it this far in row echelon form. We have uh, leading columns. This one's not fully simplified, but that's not a big deal. But we can see that there is uh, the opportunity for a free variable here. So first, let's talk about what's the basic variables, and if we look, they're the ones that have a leading entry. So in this case, it would be our x1, our x2, and our x4. Now that means that x3 is considered a free variable, because you see none of it, there is no leading one or leading coefficient in that column. So how do we write the solution to the system? Well, the first thing to do is write each of those uh, rows of the matrix as an equation. That's a great way to start. So I would say that this is 1x1 plus 2x3 equals 5, and then 3x2 plus x3 equals 6. We would write that x3 is free, and that x4, if we look, is just 3. And what we do here is we rewrite these equations uh, so that it is the basic variable equals everything else. So here I would subtract the 2, or the 2x3. And the second, for x2, I'd end up dividing by 3 and subtracting the x3. And then the other two were already simplified. Now that would be one way we could state the variables, but what you'll often see is the parametric vector form. So how does that work? Well, if we think about first writing it uh, as a, a vector, or if you think about it as a m by 1 matrix, if that's a better way for you to think about it. Here we have uh, those same solutions written in the column. So then what we're going to do is we're going to split it into two vectors. The first one is the constants. The second one is based on the free variable. So if I think about, if I wrote this as thinking about each of these lines as being constant plus or minus an x3. Well, I have my constants 5, 2. There is no constant in the third row, and in the fourth row, it's just the number 3. Plus, well, I can pull out the x3, because think about scaling. I can pull it out since that's the scaled value in the second vector. My top value is negative 2. My second value, my second entry is negative 1 third. My third entry was 1. 
In my fourth entry, there was no x3, so it gets a 0.